the Eliza Sidmore awardee David Quammen in conversation with visual storyteller and National Geographic fellow Erica Larson. She's the bull rider for this segment, <laughs> and I am the rodeo clown. <laughs> but I'm really glad to be here because I love her work, and she's a friend of mine. For 10 years, more than 10 years, Erica has been going to some of the most remote places on the planet, cold places and hot places, and paying careful attention to some of the most remote people in the world and the cultures that they live in and you're going to be seeing it. Um, we're going to start with a little bit of the mundane and personal, and then we're going to move toward the magical and universal. Do you remember the first photo you ever sold? No. <laughs> I, don't even, I don't remember, but I remember the first photo I ever saw, or that meant something to me. Which was what? So it was a picture um, from the Hubble of Saturn. And I remember holding it in my hands. And in that moment, you realize that everything that's so far away is so close to you. And you are of it, and it is of you. And it existed in a photo. And then I thought, that photo, that photography is magic. And magic can remind you of who you are and then who we're going to be. How old were you? That I don't remember, but maybe I was 11, something like that. I don't remember. So when you, remind me where you grew up. I was born here, just right here on the stage. No, I was in D <laughs> No, I was born in D.C., but I grew up on the eastern shore of Maryland. And when you were in high school and finishing high school and going to college, what were the expectations of your family and your friends about what you were going to be, what you were going to do. What did people think Erica was going to become? What was the pressure or the expectation? Oh, what? Um, I know that my mom said to me that um, she said I could be, uh, my mother was a cook in the home, and I could be a teacher. And you can, she said, you can do whatever you feel in your heart, and I will support it with everything. And I said, I want to be a part of this photography magic. And um, my father went and got some kind of camera, some DSLR, whatever it is, SLR camera, and put it around his neck, and that was that. Again, how old, roughly? Maybe 17. OK. And you went to college and majored in photography, right? I did, yep. Finishing that, when did you reach the point where you could say, now I am going to be a photographer and only a photographer. I can give my life to photography. I can afford it. The world is letting me do it. Well, I never looked at it that way, ever. Um, I think there's something about, you know, when you realize that it does exist and that you're part of this collective idea of how we can translate the world. It's not about, that's it, then you just are. I think it's like, right, once you know something, you can't unknow it. And so that was it. That is, so I'm not even sure it was about photography or not in that regard, whether, oh, it's something that I can continue to do or not do. It's just that now it is, and you'll have to do it. So it's, um, I don't, it just is. You weren't always a photographer of remote places and remote people. You won a World Press Photo Award for sports photography. Mm -hmm. What was that about? So, <laughs> well, you saw some of it. It was actually the young girl standing there. I don't know, the little girl there in the, she had the camo on in the woods. So it was about children and hunting. And the idea was to understand um, why children that didn't live a subsistence lifestyle wanted to be engaged in hunting. And so I think the world, I didn't enter it in the sports category. I think somebody put it in the sports category. I'm not kidding. I think at the time, World Press kind of, I might have entered it in portrait, and I think they put it in the sports category. Mm. Um, but the idea, so I, I didn't really think of it. My, it wasn't about sport, but it was about um, 
you know, why, why we wanted to connect with nature when maybe, and in all the reasons you think you don't need to. So that was the exploration, and then somebody else related it to sport. But okay, yeah. even, even then that theme was there. Mm -hmm. um, the Sami people, four years you okay. lived with the Sami people as a, a Viga, is as that a right? Biga. Biga. Mm -hmm. Tell us what that was. So a biga is, um, well, traditionally it was a woman that would come in um, uh, from maybe a family that wouldn't have had as many resources, meaning at that point reindeer. Um, and so it would go to another family and help and do things. And so um, that could be from cooking uh, to cleaning to helping with the children. But ultimately, the, one of the most important things is that you would you know, travel with the families on, on tundra and then also um, you, would, you would slaughter the animals. And so, you would, and so um, when you think about that, if the biga gets to slaughter the animals, the most important part of that connection to these cycles of life and death um, and they celebrated that, so that's what I got to do. It occurs to me we should add, in case anybody doesn't know, the Sami are this, the reindeer herding people of northern Scandinavia, so the animals that you're slaughtering, the are animals reindeer. that they're taking care of are reindeer. <clears throat> You've said on tape about that, that four-year project. You learned the language, you lived with them, you stayed, and you said, I came here in search of silence so that I could begin to hear again, this is a journal entry that you've read on tape, a journal entry while you were there. I came here in search of silence so that I could begin to hear again. I am now more a stranger in my own home than I am here. Uh, help us understand what led you to do that. I'm going to go spend four years with the Sami in northern Norway. You were in your early 30s about that point, right? You had been a photographer, uh, been a professional photographer. Did you come to some sort of a crisis point or a point of discomfort with your own life in the South? Um, well, I was in New York City at the time. So um, I think there came a point I was, I had been working a lot, um, yeah, doing a lot of editorial work, but um, really, um, amazing work, but um, kind of going in and out of families, and it sort of existed on two levels. I was working with um, a lot of, um, you know, maybe in our demographic of like 60 and over, and a lot about how we in that age group deal with what it is to, to get older, our relationship to family, our relationship to landscape, our relationship to death, but also how we perceive the world, so dementia, Alzheimer's, and these. So I was doing a lot of stories on that. And then I was also working a lot with adolescents, and so things around, um, you know, what it is to be a teenager, mostly in, in, in society in the United States, um, the whole range of it. And I said, um, and it was amazing, but I realized that for my own, um, I, so I think I was constantly dealing with themes of life and death, but in these situations, and I had begun my personal work exploring hunting to take a different look at life and death that was removed from the human or what I perceived as the human, because it actually isn't, but, but what I perceived as the human emotion around it. And, um, and then from that, I was getting these glimpses of seeing when I would go on these hunts, I would realize spending time, kind of deeper time in nature, away from a place like New York City, and even away from these sort of familial situations that I was like, living in these homes, I, rem I could feel like this kind of beginning of like a fine-tuned instrument starting to happen. And as I would see animals, you'd be, I could begin to see these um, ancestral stories. And then I realized it's our story like our human story. And you could see that through, and I thought, my goodness, if I, it's, so it's not that you're telling stories, you're remembering them. And, um, and it was really strong, and I said, I have to learn to hear again, because I have a glimpse of it, but I need to, so I needed to break all the parts and begin to hear again. And, that's, and then I thought, okay, so where can I do that? And so I first went to the Amazon. I don't know why, but that's where I went. Um, and I realized in that time it wasn't where I was meant to be. It was like going into this dark, dark, dark ground underneath. Um, but that's where I found my son and I found my husband. But that wasn't time yet. And then I said, what's the opposite of the Amazon? And I'm sure scientifically it's not this. But I thought, <laughs> what is it? And I said, that's the Arctic. 
And I went to the Arctic, and I, that was, and you just, everyone just got to see Jenya. So maybe from what you, under, for, which, which she just translated of the Arctic, it's, there's something, right? It's something that this land holds. And so that's why I went. Four years. You had found your husband. You had your son. Not yet. I had found them both, but had not had either of them. Okay. <laughs> We started, this, we started this afternoon with oceans, and you have to understand that this woman is as deep as an ocean. Let's talk a little bit about ritual. Uh, you've, you've said that ritual, and you've, you've put it on the slides, ec an exploration of ritual. It's sort of the overriding theme of your collected body of work and the grant work recently. Um, ritual, especially in the lives of remote peoples. What do you mean when you say, as you've said to me, and I, I think you've said in other places, ritual allows us to explore time? Mm. So, well, I'm still learning what that means, and perhaps I always will be. But um, I have, um, I have a belief in. So, for my life, that you know, as we're trying to understand. So I, I believe we're remembering who we are to be humans, right? I think that's what, for me, that's what this journey is about. It's this process of, of remembering who we are. And so in that, we have to, um, we get confronted with our perceptions of time. And you know, on, on, on the most basic level, right, every culture holds a different understanding of what time is and how to, how to express it and, 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 and how to teach us about that. Um, and so I, I've, I've gone through different phases of, of, of watching um, time be one thing and then become another. And then I realized that, that in order for, to understand the next sort of level of how I'm experiencing time, I need a place of, of liminal space. And liminal space is, is this moment when you know everything is but, but isn't. It's the time of, of before but after. And I think it's also a really difficult time. But within that, that's when you can. And, sort of like break break the concept of what you had perceived the moment before. And then I, I, I realized that um, you know, when I'm watching ritual, and whatever ritual is, whether it's washing dishes, whether it's a prescribed ritual that's been going on for 10,000 years, but when you're watching ritual, it is a time for, for this liminal space to exist. And within liminal space, we can all begin to have that moment to connect to what it means to be human. So that's. Liminal space, transitional space. Yeah, I think it's transitional space. I think it's like a time of the green room. It's, Is that liminal that's space? That's a type of liminal space. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, there's a there's a line from William Faulkner uh, that you just put me in mind of from his book uh, Light in August. I think it starts the fifth chapter. He's telling these deep stories about some really troubled, fraught people. And the chapter begins, memory believes before knowing remembers. Does that make any sense to you in terms of what you're thinking? Absolutely. And I've heard it different ways, that um, the future is the past. And, but yet, yeah, the past is the future. Um, I think I was talking to someone last night, and my Brain's going to block it out, but they said, um, um, it, it's, but it, we're always in contradiction. We're in contradictions to what we think. So the minute you have this, then it's like, you know, it's contradictory over here. So yes, it, I think it, it makes a bit of sense. But I, I think the fact that it doesn't make sense is what keeps us on the exploration. Yeah. Uh, let's look at and talk about some of these particular images, OK? Yes. <laughs> if I can find the ones that I want to ask you about. Excuse me if we just, OK, so this is probably the end of that loop. And now we're starting. OK. Uh, let me just ask you about that. Why does a hunter collect bare feet? Mm. I don't know why. Um, why we collect anything. Um, 
but I think collection is, I believe in that the things that we experience, there's, there's many levels of it. And the one level is our physical manifestation of, and the, the Earth's physical manifestation of all of these things. So therefore, it becomes our collection. Um, I, I don't think all hunters collect. I think many do, and all don't. What I think is that hunters guide us and many guide us to look at the one thing that's difficult, right? We, we're looking at our death, um, and we're looking at what it means to bring death. And because there's a part of it also that um, we feel there's the idea of sustenance, and, and so how we live and how we take as part of this sort of larger ecosystem of, of, of life and death and what we need to, to live and survive. And so there's many things that we're questioning. So I, I see hunters less as collectors, but guides into that. Um, but I think many collect. This photo is also part of your hunting group. This is the, the one that won the sports thing. I'm not surprised. <laughs> okay. so, um, so this is a North American girl? Yes. Who's part of a hunting family? Her name's Mary, and she's from Georgia. And she's probably in her 20s now. OK. Well, the thing that I want to ask you about is what might connect this photo with some of the later photos. And I'm going to jump ahead to them. but. Freeze this photo in your mind, this photo of Mary in her camo, Mary in full camo. And um, why does a person wear camo? Because it's a pattern that connects you with nature, right? Is that fair? I think that's very fair. OK. Oh, there's the video. There we go. Yeah. OK. Um, the lady on the right and that pattern. Um, so this is stuff that um, I'm very, I don't know, but this is what my exploration is, is trying to understand. So I think that we are interpreting the world around us, right? I believe, or for me, that the, the journey is that nature, because by remembering, we're all remembering that we are nature. I believe so. We are of nature. Um, it's exactly what you're doing in your books in, in, in the way that you do it. We're remembering this. And as we remember it, we need to put it out there. We need to physically manifest it in these different ways. So, um, you know, um, Realtree did it for Mary. And, um, <laughs> and um, this woman here, she's wearing the, the her Icaros or her, uh, her songs of, of her interpretation of her landscape um, in the rainforest of Peru. And, but what's interesting, and again, this is my interpretation of the understanding of it. This is not her words or who she is, but as I, and, but right, so, so it's, it's the patterns of, of actual, the physical nature we see, the patterns we see on, on the animals, on the snakes. It's the patterns that she's able to verbalize through her voice and then it becomes a physical pattern, but then at the same time, it's actually the internal pattern of our DNA makeup as well. So it's all of these things um, put together, and it's just one translation. And we all have our translation of that. We're all translating this. Uh, this is the people who have um, that idea of kene which is the pattern, and they, um, you call them uh, people of Ronin, the great serpent. serpent. Um, it's an important animal for them, the anaconda. Yes, yeah. Yes, because the anaconda has all of the patterns, all of the patterns of the world, of their world, of their translation of the world, of our world, of the collective world. Um, and so the, the, the snake has it, there's ever-changing patterns, and there's never two, that never ends, and it never doesn't end. And here you can hear her singing, singing the pattern. Do I need to click One again? One more time. The woman on the left. That's Emma Full Moon. What is she thinking? 
I don't know what Emma's thinking. Um, These are the people who live with and from salmon. Yes. Yeah, so this is um, here we're in Alaska um, with, with a community of Yupik. Um, I don't know what Emma thinks, but I will tell you about the first time I met Emma. So you walk into a place. I walked into Quinnahawk. It's like a village of 600 people. Um, and obviously, everyone's going to know that you're not from Quinnahawk. So you're walking down the street. And I thought, it's a horrible, horrible feeling. I mean, I feel like you're like, it's a horrible feeling to walk in and just bah. So I just, I found a walrus hanging on a door. And I thought, well, I want to go and go where that walrus, it was, it was the walrus skull, the full walrus wasn't there, just the skull. Um, and I walked and I knocked on the door and Emma answered the door. And um, I just introduced myself and she said, okay, come in. And I just, she just, I sat down on the floor and she was just cleaning berries, She's just cleaning berries. So I, again, I don't know what's in Emma's thoughts, but what I can say is that she expresses herself by the things that she does by opening the door and just cleaning the berries, um, by letting me see this moment, um, by a gesture that she'll do. So that's. OK. That's his, a seal that this she's getting This is a seal. Out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to bounce. Oh, well, let's listen to this. OK, so I can, well, I'll. Yeah. Um, so the story goes um, about, uh, let's say, they, they s yeah, okay. Um, they're Yupik, in, in over the past 80 years, um, they, because of the Christian missionaries um, that went in, they, they stopped dancing and they stopped relating uh, to their natural world in the way that they always had, in the way that they would translate it. Um, and one of the big things was dance. Um, they didn't stop hunting, but they stopped describing the hunt in the same way. And so we're, we're, we're in um, the western, southwestern Alaska, and we're also right on the Bering Sea. And so as we're seeing this permafrost melt happening, you are watching, um, uh, of, uh, you're watching sort of the land come up, things melt, and you're watching these rising sea levels, and so this go down. And so in this huge transition that you're seeing go on, um, you're also seeing these huge cultural transitions. And, um, and, and who are the, the people explaining the cultural transitions, the ones that are there? And one thing that happened, so there's this old village that's literally coming out of the ground that maybe we can say for sure 600 years, I'll let the the village and the archaeologists say maybe it's even more than that, maybe closer to a thousand years old. But this old Yupik village is coming out of the ground called Nunalak, or the old village. And as the old village is coming out, you're literally year, and, and this has been going on for over 20 years, year after year, um, the, the history and the, the stories, all the oral stories are physically manifesting itself again. So it's the past, in that, the future that is the past, or the past that is the future. But it's all coming back. And so something that happened is some of the youth there, I think, go through transitions of, of, of how they identify with their landscape and who they are. And one, one boy, Michael, walked out to the Nunalik, the old village, and he sort of maybe, if my words tripped over an artifact, but I think that's, that's, that's my words. I think in his words, he found um, his, his ancestor. And um, he went back to the village that had really been in debate about whether they would actually archaeologically dig this site and preserve it. He went back and he said, um, it's, it's time to do this. And, um, and then other children said, we can hear the voices and we're going to dance again. We haven't danced in 80 years. And the, the, the elders said yes. Um, they began to work with other people to 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 um, uh, to um, 
what do you want to say, sort of birth the village again, this old village. And, um, and now I went to Mike, that's the, the boy you saw, and I went over there and he said, do you want me to show you the seal hunting dance? And it was right after, it actually was probably the same day, I think it was the same day that Sarah, who I stay with when, I, when I'm there, um, her son Jared brought home the seal. And I, she opened the seal like this, and I'm looking at her, and there's so much. I, you can see, like, you can, for me, you see the transitional time of, of relating to the seal. And in the, later on that day, we went over, and Mike said, let me show you the seal hunting dance. And so that's what that was. I want to see it again. <laughs> So, um, ritual, you've seen ritual change over time. Oops. Um, and, uh, and maybe, is it fair to say that ritual helps a culture deal with change? We think of, we think of, we tend to think of ritual as frozen, as this is frozen culture, but, but ritual, is it a tool that helps people endure change that comes to their landscape and their culture? I think we are change. So therefore, we're, it's a way to express who we are. Who is this? <laughs> who do you think it is? <laughs> I think it's, um, well, I, I've got a sad answer and a happy answer to that. I think it's a, um, it's, a, it's a dying culture looking to the gods for help. But um, I don't know, maybe it's also Erica. <laughs> hmm. who, do you, who do you think it is? <laughs> Tell us what it is. And is there a ritual use of it? So, okay, on this, um, so in this journey, I, I, this is um, and, Western. And bear in mind that it has to happen. In, in 25 seconds. Well, maybe I'll just leave. You guys can maybe figure out who it is. I don't know if I can do that in 20 seconds. Um, really, I can't. I can't. I okay. can't. <laughs> That's a good place to stop. It's inexplicable. Thank you. Okay. That's good. Thank you.